Today we're going to compare and introduce three kinds of force fields. The gravitational force field, the electric force field, and the magnetic force field. The idea of a field was introduced to explain action at a distance. Meaning, let's say we've got the Earth over here. And over here we've got the Moon. Then we know there's a force of attraction between them. However, there isn't anything actually between them. That's empty space out there. So we've got a force without any contact. To explain that, it was postulated that there must be some sort of field. And this field would interact with the moon and cause an attraction on it, and it would interact with the earth and cause an attraction on it. So fields explain action at a distance. The three fields that we study in this course are the gravitational field, the electrostatic or electric field, and the magnetic field. The gravitational field is simply a force of attraction between masses. So all masses in the universe attract. That's it, Newton's universal law of gravitation. As it turns out, this force is so small, unless you've got really, really big masses, that you don't usually consider it unless you're talking about things with really big mass, like a planet or a star but it's present even for tiny, tiny masses. Second is the electrostatic force, and it's very, very similar. If I have two charges, Q1 and Q2, then they will attract, but only if the charges are opposite. If the charges are like, then you'll get repulsion. So it's a little more complex than the gravitational field because you can get attraction or repulsion. And this third force, the magnetic force, is really a force between moving charges. So if we've got two current carrying wires right beside each other, then we have two sets of moving charges. And they're going to attract if the currents are in the same direction. But if the currents are in the opposite direction, will get a repulsion. And of course there's going to be a strong relationship between a field that's created by charges versus a field that's created by moving charges. So you've probably heard of electromagnetic fields as well. Now a force field is always equal to a force per unit fundamental quantity. So in the case of gravity, we use a G to represent the magnitude of the field and it's going to equal the force per unit mass because mass is the fundamental quantity for gravity. So on the surface of the Earth we know G is equal to 9.8 newtons of force acting on every kilogram of mass. And of course that leads to an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. For the electric field we're going to use a capital E to represent the electric field strength. And it's going to equal the force acting per fundamental quantity for the electric field, and that is the charge. And we're going to use a Q to represent the charge. The units are going to come out to be units of force divided by units of charge, which is coulombs. So the electric field is going to be the number of newtons of electric force acting per coulomb of charge at a particular point. And then for the magnetic field, we're going to use a capital B to represent the magnetic field strength. I'm not going to write a formula for it because it's a, a little bit more complicated, but I will tell you the units for it. It's going to be units of force, which is newtons, per units of fundamental quantity for the magnetic field. And that fundamental quantity, what creates magnetic fields, is moving charges. So for the charge part, we need coulombs. That's the units for charge. For the motion part, moving charges, we need units of motion, which is just the units of speed, meters per second. So the units for the magnetic field is going to be newtons per coulomb, meter per second. And that's a little bit complicated to say, so we usually simplify that and simply call it a Tesla, named after Nikolai Tesla. The units for the magnetic field strength are the Teslas. Let's see if you understood that idea of a field being the force per fundamental quantity. Pause the video, read the question, try it out, 
come back for the answer. This question is about gravitational field, which is going to be the force per unit fundamental quantity mass. In this case, we've got a 10 kilogram mass, and it's resulting in a 50 newton force. So the gravitational field strength must be 5 newtons acting per kilogram. Let's try a second example, this time with the electric field. Pause the video, read the question, try it out, come back for the answer. So the electric field is the electric force acting per unit charge. And in this case, our electric field is 30 newtons per coulomb. And it's causing a force of 90 newtons on a certain charge. So the charge must be equal to 90 newtons divided by 30 newtons per coulomb, which is going to equal 3 coulombs. We must have a 3 coulomb charge. Now what we want to do is compare the directions of the force to the field for the gravitational, electric, and magnetic fields. Let's start with gravity and we'll take a simple common example where we're on the surface of the Earth so we've got a mass here above the surface of the Earth while of course the G field points down. And the force on the mass, it's also down. So for the gravitational field, force and field have same direction. It's the simplest case. Next simplest case would be the electric field. So let's take our electric field coming downwards. There's our E field. If we do that, then the force could either be upwards if you've got a negative charge, or it could be downwards if you've got a positive charge. So in the case of the electric field, force and field in same or opposite directions. The more complex field is the magnetic field. So let's suppose our B field is in this direction. But in this case we have another direction that we've got to consider because we've got moving charges. And the moving charges are going to have a direction as well. So there's the direction of the moving charge. And it turns out the force is going to be in one of two directions. It's either going to be out of the page, and this is supposed to be an arrow coming out of the page, or it could be into the page. This is supposed to be the back of an arrow to represent an arrow going into the page. So that's the direction of the force. So in the case of the magnetic field, the force is always perpendicular to the plane containing B and V, where V is the velocity of the moving charges. So we end up with a more complicated perpendicular relationship in the case of the magnetic field. Now if we want to draw a field, and it doesn't matter whether it's an electric field, a magnetic field, or a gravitational field, we need to indicate two things. We need to indicate how big is the field, what's the magnitude of the field. And we need to indicate, at any point, what's the direction of the field. Now we could do this by drawing a whole bunch of vectors. But the vectors would begin to cross over each other and it would get quite complicated. So we do what's called a field line diagram. And a field line diagram might look something like this. With arrows on the lines. So if I want to know in what direction does the field point, I can pick out any point and I can more or less approximate what direction the field's going to be by looking at the neighboring lines. I can see that over here it's pointing in this direction, over here it's pointing in this direction. I've got to assume it's going to be pointing in about the same direction right here. So we just use the arrows to get the direction of the field. To get the magnitude of the field, the size of the field at any point, we look at how close the lines are together. So right about here, the lines are quite close together. Whereas, say here, the lines are farther apart. And the closer the lines are together, the stronger the field. The farther apart they are, the weaker the field. So more or less, on one of these field line diagrams, the magnitude of the field varies as the line density. How close the lines are 
to one another. Now what we call a uniform field would of course be a field with a constant magnitude and a constant direction. So if it's got a constant magnitude, the lines have to be equally spaced. If it's got a constant direction, all the arrows have to point in the same direction. So if we want to draw a uniform field, we should end up with straight lines that are equally spaced. So this would be an example of a field line drawing where we've got a uniform field. So we've got uniform spacing and one direction. Let's now take a look at the motion of particles in uniform fields. And we'll look at a gravitational field, an electric field, and a magnetic field. So in each case, we're going to deal with a uniform field. So we got gravitational, electric, and magnetic. In the case of the gravitational field, well, we've really already studied that because we talked about projecting masses into gravitational fields and we found that they executed parabolic paths. And it's very similar for particles in an electric field. Of course, now we would be dealing with charges and we could have positive charges and they would execute a familiar parabolic path, whereas a negative charge would execute a parabola in the opposite direction. But in either case, the resulting path is once again parabolic. You only really get a new type of motion with the uniform magnetic field. So the magnetic field acts on moving charges, and if we project our moving charge into a magnetic field, it will circle around the field lines like so in a spiral or what's called a helical path and it's circling the field lines. And if our positive charge is circling in say a clockwise direction the negative charges would circle in a counterclockwise direction. So the force on a negative charge would be in the opposite direction to the force on a positive charge. It's fairly easy to obtain uniform fields. In the case of gravity, we always have a near uniform gravitational field around us. So typically for a uniform gravitational field, we simply use the surface of the Earth, or near the surface. To obtain a uniform electric field, we take a couple of plates, a couple of conducting plates, connect a battery across the plates, and you'll get a uniform electric field in between the plates. So we use parallel plates to get a uniform electric field. For a uniform magnetic field we typically use a coil of wire, a tightly wrapped coil of wire which is called a solenoid. We attach a battery to that solenoid so that a current will flow through it and then inside the solenoid you'll get a near uniform field. So typically we get uniform magnetic fields with solenoids. Or it could be coils. And a good example of that is, is something called a Helmholtz coil and it's often used in experimental work. Here's an IB question. It's asking you what type of field, electric, gravitational, or magnetic, would satisfy each of the following conditions. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. First thing we can do is just look at the charge in the particle. Because if it's uncharged, then it's got to be the gravitational field. The electrical and the magnetic only operate on charged particles. The initial direction of motion has nothing to do with the field itself. So we can ignore this call. And then we want to compare the direction of the field to the force. So opposite to direction of field sounds like a negative charge in an electric field. In the same direction as the field, that sounds like a positive charge in an electric field. But when we start talking about things being normal, about 
field and force being normal to one another, then you've got to be dealing with a magnetic field. Let's summarize the key points of the video by filling in this chart. So the fundamental quantity for gravitation is mass. The electric field, it acts on charge. And the magnetic field, it acts on moving charge. The units for the gravitational field, well, it's the force per unit mass, so it's going to be newtons per kilogram. Electric field is the force per unit charge, so it will be the number of newtons per coulomb. In the magnetic field, it's going to be the force acting on a moving charge, so it's going to be the number of newtons per coulomb times a meter per second. In comparing the force and field directions for the gravitational field, they're both the same. The force and the field are in the same direction. But for the electric field, the force is in the same direction for positive charge, but in the opposite direction for negative charge. And then for the magnetic field, the force is perpendicular to both the velocity of the charges and the direction of the B field. And finally, the paths in a gravitational field send in a moving particle, and you'll get a parabolic path. Same thing for the electric field. But for the magnetic, you get that helical path. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.